Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to just wait a couple of minutes so we can get everyone into our Zoom meeting. Wonderful to have you here. Again, thank you. We have so many participants joining us. I know we're all looking forward to an amazing panel today about a really, really important topic. So we'll get started in just a minute. So welcome again, if you're just joining us to this conversation about how K through 12 schools can take action on climate change. We'll give it just another 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Okay. Well, we're over 200 participants. So again, thank you everyone. Welcome for this very important conversation today. Uh, my name is Bridget Terry Long and I am the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It's wonderful to welcome you to be a part of this conversation as part of the Ask With Education Forum, our signature lecture uh, series that brings together leaders in the education field to our community to share knowledge, experience and insights. This forum was established to strengthen the intellectual life of the school through the exchange of ideas, conversation, and debate. And today we will be talking about climate change, the recently re uh, released K-12 Climate Action Plan, and how the education sector can be a force towards climate solutions and an environmental justice. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Today's episode is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can also visit gse.harvard.edu slash askwith for recordings and for information on future episodes. And please submit your questions throughout today's webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You will also find closed caption access there as well. As we shared in the description for today's event, climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time, and schools have a sizable environmental impact. With nearly 100,000 public K-12 schools in the United States occupying 2 million acres of land, the American education system serves over 7 billion meals annually with related food waste. Schools operate one of the largest mass transportation fleets in the country with over 480,000 diesel school buses. And schools are one of the largest public energy consumers. I share this because it is critical for us to understand the significant environmental impacts that our K through 12 public education system has. I believe, as many of you do as well, that it is our duty as citizens of this planet to do what we can to address the climate crisis and minimize our impact in contributing to the problem. This past September, the Aspen Institute, working with a distinguished and dedicated group of education leaders and experts, released the K-12 Climate Action Plan. And to borrow from this report, from wildfires to flooding to extreme heat, the impacts of climate change are threatening our communities, our health, our well being, our economy, and our future. The existential threat of climate change will increasingly impact all aspects of our society, from agriculture to business, from healthcare to education. Heat, air pollution, and extreme weather are already impacting students' health and learning and will only be exacerbated in the future. And so today we focus on the significant issue as I agree with the report that we must all take action and advance climate solutions. As I shared earlier, the education sector is a major contributor to the causes of climate change, but that also means that it can be an important part of the solution. Still, as highlighted by the K-12 Climate Action Plan, to date, the education sector has yet to establish its role in addressing climate change, and the large-scale climate solutions too often overlook the role that education can play. And for that reason, I'm very excited about the opportunity to bring together four incredible national education leaders to discuss how we can effectively mitigate, adapt, educate, and advance equity to address climate change. So I'm delighted to welcome our guests and our moderator. 
Uh, so first, uh, we have John King, who's president of the Education Trust, a national nonprofit organization that seeks to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps from preschool through college. John has been a long friend of HGSE, and he also served in President Obama's cabinet as the 10th U.S. Secretary of Education. He began his career in education as a high school social studies teacher in Puerto Rico and in Boston, and as a middle school principal. So welcome again, John. Thanks so much. Next, we have Pedro Martinez, who is the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, Mr. Martinez came to Chicago with his family at the age of eight, excuse me, age of five in search of a better life. The oldest of 12 children, his CPS journey began as a student on Chicago's West Side. He was the first in his family to graduate from high school and college, and he chose to dedicate his life to education, eventually returning to the school system of his youth as the Chicago Public Schools Chief Financial Officer from 2003 to 2009, and now CEO. Welcome, Pedro. Thank you for having me. And then the third person on the panel is Becky Pringle, who's president of the National Education Association, the nation's largest labor union. Becky is a fierce social justice warrior, defender of educator rights, and an unrelenting advocate for all students and communities of color, and a value and respected voice in the education arena. A middle school science teacher with 31 years of classroom experience, and I believe one of her, one of her former students is in the audience. Uh, and is an HGSC EPM student, so welcome. Um, Becky is focused on uniting the members of the largest labor union with the entire nation and using that collective power to fulfill the promise of public education. Becky, welcome again. And then finally, our moderator for today's conversation is Professor Jennifer Cheatham. Jen is senior lecturer uh, of education and faculty co-chair of the Education Leadership Organizations and Entrepreneurship Master's Program at HGSC. For over six years, she served as the superintendent of the Madison Metropolitan School District, and she previously served as chief of instruction for the Chicago Public Schools and as executive director of curriculum and instruction for the San Diego City Schools. Jen is also co-chair of the Public Education Leadership Project, or PELP. So please join me in welcoming all of them as I turn it over to our moderator, Jen Cheatham. All right, thank you, Bridget. I am absolutely thrilled to be moderating this panel with a group of educators I admire on a topic of critical importance in our field. Grappling with climate, the climate crisis is uh, very personal for many of us. For me as a former superintendent of a public school district where our youth ad advocated for specific actions on climate, including a renewable energy resolution that would guide the district's long range facilities plan. I'm constantly reminded that our youth need for us to think and act with their futures in mind. And I know that Charles Waugh, one of our student advocates um, for Madison is also on this call uh, listening in today. From where you sit, whether as an educator, a leader, a parent, a community member, can each of you share, just to get us started, in about a minute each, why you think it is important to take action on climate change today? Peter, do you want to get us started? Sure, sure. So right. Thank you again for having me. It's, it's my honor. Uh, you know, so being the, the head of one of the largest districts in the country, uh, you know, we talked, you know, earlier uh, we shared, you know, it was shared how many buildings our industry has, our K-12 uh, education system has, how many our footprint, our, as well as the number of buses we have, uh, the millions of children that we serve. So I see, I see our role in two parts. One is, of course, uh, here in Chicago, we are in the third largest city of the country. We are the largest real estate owner. And our buildings are old. And by the way, our challenges are not any different than Philadelphia or New York or Boston, many, many cities that have old buildings. And I see an opportunity for us as we as we renovate our buildings, as we think, as we modernize our buildings to also address climate change. So being strategic on the front end and also, you know, really sharing that with our taxpayers who, are, who, call, who of course, fund those renovations. And then, of course, as, as, an, as an educational institution, we have a moral obligation to make sure that our children, that they understand the impact of climate change, as well as not only for their education, but also to think about jobs of the future. Because one of the things that, that is great about solving climate change, it isn't just 
addressing those direct issues. It's also looking at what opportunities exist for new industries and great opportunities for our children, who we know, uh, you know could have great paying jobs as well as making a change in our society. Pedro, thank you so much. Uh, Becky, how about you? Why climate action and why now? Thank you, uh, Jen, and it's, it's such an honor to join uh, such distinguished panelists this afternoon. Oh my goodness, so for, for me as a science teacher, it's hard for me to, to believe that we have to, in 2022, be still making the case for saving our planet. For us as educators, climate justice is, is actually at the core of education justice because we know that our most marginalized communities are our students and families who live in those areas that are most impacted by climate change. As with everything else, if they are not in a stable environment, a safe environment with, with health, uh, safe drinking water, um, we know that they can't learn. So for us as educators, not only is it about uh, fighting a righteous fight for our students, but we know we have uh, a responsibility. We have a responsibility as educators to educate our students and the communities at large so that as we think about solving these complex problems, that we are very clear that it is our shared responsibility, our shared responsibility, all of us, to do what we know we must to make this earth a place where my great grandchildren can live and breathe and thrive. We see this fight as central to what we have to do, our moral responsibility as educators. Thank you, Becky. And let's pass over to John. John, why climate action, why now? Thanks, Shannon. It's an honor to, to join all of you. And I'm so grateful to Pedro and Becky for being a part of the K-12 Climate Action Commission effort and thrilled to join them on, on this discussion. You know, I think Pedro's point about our kind of moral responsibility, given the infrastructure footprint of the education sector is exactly right. Becky's point about uh, the importance of climate justice and our moral responsibility on issues of equity when it comes to the environment is exactly right. I think for me, a lot of the way I think about this issue is as a parent, uh, my girls are 15 and 18, and they are going to live in this world that is already being profoundly shaped by the impact of climate change. You know, we live in Maryland, we're already seeing the consequences of climate change. This isn't a 50 years from now problem. This is a today problem. Uh, we have flooding regularly in Annapolis, Baltimore, Ellicott City and Howard County. Uh, we've got farmers out on the eastern shore of Maryland who are literally today losing farmland because of saltwater intrusion. And we also have all of the consequences of generations of pollution. There are kids who miss school in Baltimore today because of asthma that is due to air pollution as a result of environmental injustice. So I want to leave my kids a world that is healthier. And the only way we get there is through climate action, and we need a sense of urgency. And for us, this conversation today and the work of the commission are really about trying to bring that urgency to the sector, to say, we, we can't put this off. We can't just set goals for 2050. We got to be engaged in this work right now to change our practices and move away from fossil fuels. Mm, I hear the urgency in all the responses. The, the issues are steep. In reading the art of the, the report, air quality, safe drinking water, diesel fuel buses, underinvestment in our school bus, buildings, food waste, right? The list goes on and on. And yet the opportunities are tremendous. The vision that the, the report lays out, where our nearly 100,000 public schools could be leaders in this area, is so compelling. Uh, John, you are co chair of the K-12 Climate Action Commission, which produced this comprehensive report on how schools and educators can lead on this issue. Can you share with us a little bit more about just generally the work of the commission? 
Sure. Well, well, first, let me say I'm very grateful to co-chair the commission with Christy Todd Whitman, who was governor of New Jersey, was EPA administrator for George W. Bush. I think it's a powerful statement to have two former cabinet members from different parties saying this is an urgent issue that requires not just bipartisan, but nonpartisan action. Everybody's got to be working on this issue. And we've got a very diverse commission. We've got folks from education, folks who work on environmental issues, folks from the civil rights community, a lot of young activists and leaders who have been a part of the commission work. And the first thing we did was we listened. We spent a year doing a listening tour, talking to folks from all over the country about what they were seeing. And we tried in the report really to tell their stories and capture their experiences. And, and what we describe is that the K-12 community can be mobilized in several ways. One, there's all the infrastructure work, right? Moving our schools to net zero, moving our bus fleets to electric, doing the things from an infrastructure perspective that would reduce our fossil fuels footprint as quickly as possible. But then there's all these educational things that we can do. You know, and having Becky's voice as a science teacher has been very powerful. And this is, a, this is something that students should be learning about in science class. They should be learning about the sociological implications of climate change in social studies class. They should be reading about climate change and, and its causes and consequences. They should be using statistics to figure out what we need to do differently to tackle environmental justice issues. So this is a multidisciplinary educational opportunity. There's also a career and technical education opportunity here to prepare young people for jobs in renewable energy. And then there's mitigation work and resilience work. Look, we've seen this through the COVID period, um, how important schools are as community hubs. And when we see the consequences of climate change, my mother was born in Puerto Rico. That, that's where my, my family, part of my family is from. Uh, we've seen there the consequences of Hurricane Maria and what that meant for the island and the role that schools can play as places where folks can get internet, where folks can get power, hopefully uh, through renewable energy sources. Um, the schools become the place where folks go for food, sometimes for temporary housing in the midst of a natural disaster. Sadly, we're going to have more of those climate change induced crises and schools are going to have a critical role to play in terms of community resilience. John, I um, love that the commission spent a year listening and learning to students and families and community members. I want to just dig into that for a little while and lift up some of those voices. Can each of you spend uh, just a little time sharing with the audience some of your major takeaways from the listening sessions. And if there's particular stories or examples that you can lift up, we would love to hear those too. Um, Becky, would you mind starting us off? What did you hear on the listening tour? Um, sure. Did you, Jen, did you say a few minutes? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could possibly, <laughs> possibly. And just picking some of the stories, uh, you know, my goodness, it was quite a, extraordinary. I, I wanna thank um, uh, John and Governor Whit Whitman for really being thoughtful about the, the people they allow the commissioners to, to engage with. And that's what we did. You know, we listened and they created space for us to have, to ask questions. We, you know, went into small groups so we could really dig in. Um, so that not only could we hear their stories, but, but we can begin to see possibilities emerge. And as we think, I said before, you know, this is a complex problem. So it's going to require complex, comprehensive solutions. And so the more people um, we had the opportunity to really just wrestle with the problem, you know, it, it really, I, at least for me, I, I can tell you, uh, not only did it enrich uh, the work that I that I get to do right now, um, but it generated a lot of other questions, which is always important, right? Asking those powerful questions, and and so we were able to be in this space. I, I, I you're making me choose a couple, so I'm gonna choose a couple, but I'm gonna always every all the time, John. You know, you know me, right? I'm gonna start with the students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh mm -hmm. my goodness, were they amazing guys? Were they, Pedro? That's what? right. 
Oh my goodness. So I could talk about it. So I'm just going to, you know, the, the, the two students uh, from Salt Lake City, you know, just reminded us all, not, not that we needed a reminder, but, but the powerful role, role that students can and they are playing right now, right now. They are playing that role. They are they are pushing their school districts. They're they're um, organizing their communities. Um, and here's the thing: what was really intriguing about them, our students from Salt Lake City, is they thought about their role in in teaching. So they they thought about that that part of their work in helping people learn about the issue. And then what I loved about their strategy is they thought about, okay, so how can we build capacity? How can we build our capacity, our students, our community, so that, that we, can, we can center their voices? How do we make sure we have diverse voices in these conversations? And then, of course, ultimately to take action. And so these two students led an effort to actually have their Salt Lake City um, school board uh, ultimately adopt, but they went through this process, right? That I just described, but to ultimately adopt a resolution uh, committing their, their school district to, tran to transition to 100% clean energy. Oh, my goodness, it was so, it was so powerful. I got always talk about the students. The, uh, the, another one that I wanna lift up just for me personally, personally, as, as president of NEA, which really impacted me, we heard from uh, Gil uh, uh, Rosas uh, from Stockton United, and he was talking about electric buses and what he was doing, the efforts that he and his colleagues were leading um, in building um, uh, an infrastructure structure to support those electric buses. And the reason I lift that one particularly up, it was just interesting to me what they were doing, but I lift that one up because one of the things that, that John and, and Governor Whitner, Whitmer uh, um, challenged us, I wanna say, to do as commissioners is to not just be in that space and listen, Jen, but to, to in our own spaces, when we went back, what could we do? How could we lift up these stories? And I actually took Gail's story uh, and I used it in a conversation with our, our Secretary of Transportation, uh, Secretary Buttigieg. So I was actually able to use that specific example as uh, uh, someone in our current administration was thinking about um, how they could center um, uh, this climate justice work in the work they do. And of course, I could not end my remarks without talking about our science teacher from Oklahoma, Melissa Lau. Oh my goodness. And it was so, you know, it's always interesting. You know, we didn't think our, you know, I don't know about you and you, John and Pedro, but, you know, they were coming to us as commissioners. So she was really kind of a little bit nervous at first. You know, we weren't thinking that we were making but nervous, but she was. But oh my goodness, when she got into talking about the work she was doing to teach teach climate science in her community, not just in her school, um, but in her community. Um, she And she was so surprised by, the, the, by how that was embraced and how she was supported. Um, quite extraordinary, uh, the work she was doing, not just in her school and, or in her community. I could go on and on, but I'll stop. Yeah. Becky, I so appreciate the stories, right? The examples of students pushing for policy change, the examples of teachers taking it, uh, uh, taking ownership and, um, and using their, their sphere of influence, right? To begin teaching students and communities um, about climate challenges and solutions. Um, and I, I love this example of people out there innovating as we speak, right? Trying to figure out how to make this change happen. Um, uh, I'm also curious as you're telling these examples of stories of things that were sort of new learning for you. So if you could be thinking of that, like something you didn't know before you listened that you learned as a result of listening. Um, uh, Pedro, do you wanna, Pedro? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, first of all, you know, I can't give better examples than Becky because I was, just, <laughs> I was so inspired definitely by the Salt Lake students, but other students as well. And, and I'll tell you the lesson that I learned the most, I think, you know, for me, you know, being 52 and now being in these, in these leadership roles is how our students really just, you know, they get right to the point, you know, for them, it really is. I, I was, I was inspired by the fact that it wasn't, you know, uh, you know, elected officials and, and CEOs trying to theorize and, and talk about these issues. Like we always, we're kind of used to that, right? In our, in our, in, in our uh, you, know, you know, people that we interact with, these were students that said, we see a very clear issue. They had, they created a movement. And, and what I loved was it, was, it was very organic. It was very honest. Mm -hmm. And then, and they saw it all the way through from 
making sure people had the right information, that people were engaged, and they took it. And I, and I was, I, I couldn't help but be proud of the fact that they took it all the way to the board level. Because, you know, for, for individuals like myself, we have to deal with our boards, you know, and, you know, that's how things get done, right? It isn't as simple as, as I always remind our students, like, we all have bosses, right? <laughs> and so, and so they took it to the board at a policy level. But what I love does, it was never a partisan issue. It was never, it was never about this side of politics. Or it never was about that. And so for me, probably the biggest lesson I learned is how do we as adults, how do we make sure we really focus on those core issues and not let ourselves get sucked into the partisan politics? Because, you know, um, you know, as Becky said earlier, we shouldn't have to be proving this, right? The science is very clear, but we always get roped into the, and I was, you know, at Fort Chicago, I spent six and a half years leading the San Antonio School District and I was in Texas and I could see the politics, right? Even after the natural disaster they had in Houston, that I just, you know, for my colleagues, I mean, I just felt for them, just all the things that have happened in Houston that because of, you know, lack of regulation and with climate change, just the kind of things that, that you know, the community has suffered, and so for me, you know, that, that was probably the biggest lesson is just being inspired by both our students. And I was inspired by our, by our teacher, but also we had not-for-profit organizations. We had school districts like Philadelphia also were presenting some of their strategies. And so for me, um, you know, I just love the fact that in this listening tour, we listened to so many different voices, but they were all consistent and they were all doing work in this, in this, you know, and trying to solve this very, very big challenge. So that just inspired me because, you know, we're in roles that we can have a lot more influence. Uh, and so that was the biggest lesson that I learned, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah, there are people already leading on this work. Um, let's learn from them. And, and we'll talk later about scale. So we'll get there. John, thoughts on what you, what you heard in this listening tour? What stands out in your mind? Yeah, let's share one scary one and then two hopeful. Okay. Um, so the, the scary one really was a school board member from Santa Barbara who described running for school board on a climate action um, platform and folks dismissing her and not taking her seriously. And then going to school board meetings as a newly elected school board member being the person at the meeting who says, wait, wait, before we pass this thing, why are we using solar in this building? Wait, 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 before we pass this thing, why are we moving to electric buses and not, not getting heard by her colleagues? And then sadly, there's a drought followed by mudslides in which you know climate change was a factor and people lost power. There was sadly loss of life roads were blocked, and people saw the consequences of not only climate change, but of the failure to plan for resilience. And then she got everybody's attention, and the community then committed to net zero, committed to solar in their buildings, so that the schools could actually be a resilience hub for the community when there are power outages. And what was scary about that is that could be all of us. If we don't take action in every school community, we could end up in these situations where we've missed our window of opportunity. So that really stuck with me because it's just a reminder of the urgency of this work. Two more hopeful examples quickly. One was uh, we heard from one of the P-TECH schools that is focused on uh, green jobs. And what I love about P-TECH and, and, and this has been true from the from its earliest origins as a network of schools is they start with the idea that students are going to graduate with a high school diploma an associate's degree and first in line for a job at an employer partner and they're working with a range of employers across sectors we heard from uh, green jobs effort but i just love that idea that we can get our students at the high school level on the path to that college degree and a great job and you know, it's a very compelling, I think, model uh, for us to think about scaling nationally. The, the other thing I'll always remember is we went to a net zero school in Virginia as we were preparing to launch the report. And I remember we were doing the tour and I think it was Randy Weingarten, the AFT president, Becky's colleague, who, who asked, now how much more did it cost to build this school as a net zero school? And the answer was, 
It didn't. The per square foot cost of building a net zero school was essentially the same as the average per square foot cost of building a building reliant on fossil fuels. And so that was great to hear and also gave me another burst of urgency to say, why are we building any school building in this country? Why are we doing any public building project that isn't net zero? We got to get on with it. All right. I, I love hearing these stories about the both the challenges, the opportunities. And I want to ask a, a question, Pedro, I would love to start with you because I think what a, a lot of us are curious about, and I'm seeing this in the questions that are coming up, is about uh, it's students, yes, they can help lead the way, they can actually uh, work with us, right, to, to execute on uh, these ideas, um, but, the, but some of us are positioned to make real change. And, and for example, one of the people well positioned to push for this kind of change and actually make sure it happens is the CEO or the superintendent of school systems. Um, so Pedro, what do you think the role of the superintendent is in advancing climate action? And how should they be thinking about it in light of all that school leaders are dealing with right now, um, especially in, in the COVID pandemic context? What's yeah. the role of the superintendent? You know, so I think one of the things that I have always taken very seriously in this role, this is my third superintendency CEO uh, role. And, you know, we have a responsibility to be, um, to be, to be speaking out in public and to our stakeholders about challenges that we see. And as we, you know, as my, my colleagues have shared, these are ethical issues. These are issues that really are grounded in equity. When I go to cities, you know, including my own here in Chicago, and I see where, you know, the different plants are located that are, you know, creating a lot of pollution. When I see the children that have uh, different disabilities, that I see them firsthand in my classrooms, in my schools, and, the, and you know there's probably a connection to where they live and, and the kind of, you know, the, the lack of uh, protections that exist for the environment in that community, because we know that that's what, that's what has happened historically in our country. Um, and the evidence is very clear. It's, and so I think number one, first, you know, just speaking about it, really being vocal about it. And then making sure that you know we you know we're spending uh, almost half a billion a year in capital investments in our buildings, and we're going to spend more over time if I have my way. And to the point that John said, you know, being strategic. So we have, for example, an initiative here at CPS uh, to try to be net zero with uh, using leveraging solar. Uh, we have a huge solar initiative here that I'm very proud of that I want to continue to emphasize. But also, you know, as we look at uh, any of our buildings and, and renovations. We can be a, we can not only speak about it, but we can take a role and model it for the city. We're the biggest real estate owner in the city. By the way, most of our districts tend to be the biggest real estate owners in their community, whether right. it's a small district or a large district. That's just the, you know, we just that that's who we are. And then of course the other is making sure that our children, whether they're from pre-K all the way through 12th grade that this is built into our curriculum so that we're educating our community, right? Because knowledge is power. And the reason these students are so, are so inspiring is they had the knowledge. And, and what I love about our students, they have the passion and energy and they don't think in partisan ways. You know, as adults, unfortunately, we're white, you know, we're, we've grown a little bit cynical, right? Because we know how, you know, the things are in our, in our society. Our children don't see it that way. They literally will go and say, this is wrong. So well, how are we going to fix it? What is it? Is it a policy issue? Is it, is, it a, is it a process issue? Is it because people are not, and they just think that way. And I love that. And I think we as leaders, especially that we have inspired, we have to take those lessons as well. So I think, I think on those two fronts, you know, I see that. And, and I think we, you know, we have to model it, right? I mean, we're, we're in these roles, we're serving, you know, most of our districts, urban districts, we serve the highest poverty children in our communities. And so we have to make sure we are champions in this effort because it is an equity issue. Well, that may be a perfect transition to another question that I have, Pedro, but I just need to comment. I love what you're saying about the superintendent using their seat to, to just send a clear message, right, on these issues to help educate from that powerful seat as spokesperson on these issues. 
And um, and I and I love the idea that there's this dual pronged approach working on infrastructure while simultaneously working on the education issues, curriculum and instruction, which a lot of people are curious about. I'm seeing in the Q and A, so we'll want to get back to that. Becky, I want you to pick up where Pedro left off and talk about how this is an equity issue. Equity came through loud and clear as a major pillar in the report. Why do you think it's important for the education sector to think about its role in addressing climate through an equity lens? Can you say more about that? Uh, sure, and you heard this in my opening comments as well. Um, one of the things that um, as president of the NEA, I have challenged our members and our partners, um, anyone that, that will join us uh, in our, our work to ensure that when we say every student, we actually mean every student. And we know all of the environmental issues that impact our students' ability to learn every single day. And so when we think about climate action and the fact that, you know, and I want to go back to something John said earlier, uh, you don't, we don't have to wait. We have a lot to do. And we, and like I said, it's complex, comprehensive problems and we'll take comprehensive long-term solutions, but there are things we can do right now. It's one of the reasons it was so exciting um, to listen to many of the, the uh, people who, who talk with us because they were already taking action, whether they were thinking about how they would use um, local or state or federal money to uh, do the work that was ahead of them if, they, if it was grounded, if that work was grounded in racial and social justice, which for me has everything to do with education justice. If it was grounded in that, then they always saw the opportunity to connect our work on climate justice to that. And so not only uh, talking about it from a place of education and, and John, something you said earlier made me think of this too, um, uh, you know, it's not just about addressing this in STEM, in STEM courses. It is really about integrating it throughout everything we teach. And for us to be able to do that, we have to, we have to talk about uh, the education of, our ed of educators and not just our teachers, but all, all of our educators, our nurses and counselors. I mean, my goodness, our education, our, our healthcare professionals are front and center right now, right? With COVID and all of the crises it spawned and we know the impact. When we talk about sick buildings, hmm, yeah, we know the students uh, who are going to those, those buildings, right? And so when we think about the integration of all of that so that we have an integrated approach, we talked on the commission about project-based approaches so that our students are learning and, and doing and creating in that moment and asking others to join them. We understand that it absolutely is about equity. And one of the things I wanna to say to you too, one of the things I appreciated about our leadership on this commission is they tried to make sure that, you know, if, if there were voices that were missing, that we had, the, as commissioners, we had the opportunity to say, you know, we're missing that Native American voice. Where's that Native American voice, you know? And then as we came back together, we, we tried to make sure that we included that voice so that it was a, a diversity in every way, every way you can think of diversity, mm -hmm. everyone's responsibility, racial diversity, economics, all of those things. Because if we don't get to the, to the in, inequities that are built into every single social system in this country, then we know that as we strive toward climate justice, then we will miss those opportunities to lift that up and to shine that light on what has been happening forever. And as we think about those solutions, we need to center the people who are impacted the most so we hear their voice, we are including them in the solutions, and uh, we are addressing the issues that they know are important for their families, their children to, to, to survive, honestly, and to thrive. Mm. Becky, I so appreciate that. And I 
I'm channeling some of the questions that are coming through right now. Can you say to everyone, how, what does it look like to actually uh, center the voices of the people who are most experiencing the problems of climate change right now, like in a practical sense, right? What does that look like for school and district leaders and those who support school districts right now? You know, I think from a practical sense, just to start, you know, I, you know, I always, uh, it's interesting because, you know, with COVID, we got into all these conversations of like, do you need buildings anymore? Can, why can't everybody just learn remote, right? I mean, because that was, that was the going conversation. And one of the things I share with everybody is that our learning spaces are, the, are one of the tools we have to bridge the inequities that exist in the home lives of our children. And so we have to make sure that those buildings actually do you know do provide that equity in other words that they are the wonderful learning spaces and working spaces for both our children and staff so from a practical perspective i start there is making sure that we because the one thing i would and i would say this in my former in san antonio and i say it here in chicago our buildings shouldn't reflect the poverty of our communities and they also shouldn't reflect the inequities that exist with climate change in our communities Right, and so we, it's something that I think we just have to be very, very, um, both, you know, very intentional about, but also be very, very loud about, that we have to, we have to make sure that we, we advocate. And, you know, one of the things during, during our commission work, we, all this work was going on on the legislative front, uh, at the federal level with, you know, infrastructure bills. And one of the things, and it was good timing, because we said, we gotta make sure that there's priority of resources, specifically for climate change, but also how it's impacting school districts. So that we can make these kinds. Of, so that's just one example, Jen, that I would say that to me is something that I think about all the time is, is the learning spaces that I have for my children, the working, the working spaces for my staff. Do we, are we making sure that not only are they responsible in terms of climate change, but also responsible in terms of the equity inequities that exist in our society? Yeah, what I'm hearing and what you're saying, Pedro, is uh, there's a granularity of decision-making that's necessary here. We need to understand what the big buckets of work are, are. We need to understand what the rationale is for doing so and communicating it. And we have to know the nook and cranny of these school buildings, right? What's working about them, what isn't. Um, there's, that's very powerful, Pedro. John, do you wanna say anything about this like practicality of, of centering voices in this work? Yeah, in some ways this is the, a, a perfect uh, think globally, act locally kind yeah. of, of, of issue. So two, two things we heard about in, in some of the commission meetings. One is, you know, schools have 2 million acres of land. Sadly, a lot of that land is asphalt. We have a lot of schools that have asphalt lots, which are bad for a variety of reasons. One, they exacerbate the heat islands that we have, particularly in, in many of our urban communities. And that's gonna be more and more of a problem as temperatures rise. They also uh, don't absorb water. So they're a problem when there is um, flooding as a result of you know, extreme weather events or uh, the loss of, of um, waterfront land due to climate change. So we ought to be moving to green spaces. Well, it turns out when you talk to folks in, in a community, one of the things people always say is, we need more green space. We need more space for kids to play. We need more space for community events. Green space makes for healthier communities, right? Shared gardens, where you can actually have community gardens make for healthier communities. So the, the physical space can be planned in partnership with the community in really powerful ways that tackle climate and also improve people's day-to-day -day quality of life. From a curricular standpoint, and, and you know, Becky knows this very well, and when you get to the science classroom, your immediate surroundings can be this incredible laboratory and learning space. You know, we heard from teachers and community-based organizations that are working with um, their school communities to look at water quality issues in their local community, to look at the impact of climate change on agriculture in their community, to look at the impact of climate change on things like water runoff, right? And so 
those those kinds of um, projects allow kids to better understand their community, allow you to bring community voices into the conversation in classrooms. Um, and again, though, those are ways that people can just start. This doesn't have to be, you know, we wait uh, for a five year curriculum review process. We ask, we're going to teach about water tables anyway. How do we think about that in our local situation and the relationship to climate change? So I'm going to shift us, uh, shift gears a little bit from this idea of centering voices to make really good local decisions in partnership with the communities that we serve, so powerful, to a question about scale. Everyone is asking here in the audience, we love these ideas. How do you actually bring them to scale in the education sector? I would love to hear from anyone their thoughts on that particular question. So that's always the question, right? Yeah. <laughs> How do we scope and scale? Isn't that always a question? Does that, that sound familiar, guys? Of mm -hmm. course it does. It does, it does. Um, and um, here's the thing. Uh, and, and this actually kind of ties back to your other question too, Jen. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, as I was listening um, and thinking about the, 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 uh, our work and as we were preparing our report, which by the way, John, I want to say this, you know, in this space, I am so proud of our report. I really, really am. I have posted it on our site. I send people to all the time because it's so rich with, with information, but getting to Jen's question, part of scoping and scaling is learning, you know, that, that, that's at the heart of everything. So knowing what's happening, I referenced this before and that um, our, our co-chairs challenged us in the space, you know, don't just come here and, you know, learn for yourself. What are you going to do when you go back home? What are you going to do? And so uh, in our own spaces, going back, even your the folks who are listening right now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the information you have right now and what more information you're going to get and go back into your spaces uh, to, to, to uh, start a movement? Because that's really what needs to happen. One of the things that we, you know, as I was listening and thinking about it is one of the things we don't do so well is identify those components because it can't be the same everywhere. For, you know, that's part of the centering the voices. You, the solutions have to be, be based on what, what are the realities there in that community, what are their issues and problems. And so um, one of the things that I, I like to share that I've learned is it is always about developing the processes, systems and structures to sustain what you're doing. And so when I think about the collaboration that happened within our commission, but um, uh, the collaboration that must take place across this country and around the world, by the way, um, what are we building so that that continues uh, and sustains itself? What tools are we sharing so that we can, that we can um, build on what others have learned? How are we gonna deal with this systemically? How are we gonna make sure the funding is there in a sustained and equitable way so that we are, are sure that those communities that have forever been marginalized are the ones that we are sure that, that, that we reach? One of the things that we use at the NEA, and I thought about this, John, when, in, during the commission, because as I was listening to, to some of our presenters, I, I, it, what it, I heard it come out. They didn't say it as explicitly as this, but this is what I heard. Um, we, we use what we call a um, race equity impact assessment so that every decision we make, we put it through that lens. And what it really is, is just a, a series of questions, right? Whose voice is missing in this? How will this decision impact um, our most marginalized students or communities and that kind of thing? And so one of the things I heard and that we can help with that scoping and scaling is sharing tools like this so that every decision, like the one you raised, John, where wow, we could, we could build a net zero school for the same or less money. Why would we not do that? But if you're not asking the question, then you're not doing starting that process. Um, and so a part of that, that scoping and scaling is sharing those tools, those kinds of tools so that we can build on our learnings and we can, we can um, uh, really harness our collective expertise and experience and knowledge so that we can build on each other to scope and scale. Mm, thank you so much, Becky. Pedro or John, what, do you have additional thoughts on scale? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, one is um, the the making sure that we're not doing this alone. So, for example, you know, John, your comments when we think about a great initiative we have here in Chicago, we are taking some of our spaces because uh, we are fortunate that we have land in most of our schools, and we're making them green spaces with nonprofits, our city water department, and our county water department, so that they're actually beautiful playground spaces that have a lot of green green space that are also solutions for water issues here in Chicago. Um, and, and water retention. And so, so there's, there is, um, there's some great initiatives that I think that we can, first of all, you know, really make sure that people know about and that we try to take the scale. So that's something, of course, that I would love to do across my 600 schools. I also think, um, Becky, to your point, you know, when I think about, you know, the number of, of tax reference, for example, in San Antonio, we passed uh, almost $2 billion in tax referendums to renovate every single facility because we wanted to make sure that every child had a wonderful learning space and every and our staff had wonderful working spaces. But with that, we did you know, have those conversations about how are we going to do these buildings so that they are climate friendly, that they are you know, taking advantage of whether it's solar energy or you know, just even the, the way we're constructing them. These decisions are happening right now. So imagine that if in every referendum, you know, this was part of the, you know, to your point, Becky, these were some of the questions that were asked, right? You know, you know, how are we going to handle, you know, how are we going to address equity issues within that school district or community? How are we going to handle climate issues that exist? And really using that opportunity to really educate the community, I think for me, you know, is, is one example of a way to take a scale. And again, it doesn't matter where you're in Chicago or if you're in a smaller district, a smaller city, because one of the things about climate that for me that is so clear is again, it's so evident across our communities. When you look at our communities of poverty, look at where the industrial corridors are. They tend mm-hmm. to be in these very high poverty communities. And, and I think people need to make the connections about how that's affecting the health of those families. Or I think about the water challenges that Michigan had, you know, that it, you know, all of us have seen, you know, that documentary, you know, and just the challenges and how blatant it was. And so I think it, it really is about us elevating the conversation and making it part of the work we're doing. And again, there's so many things that are happening locally, whether you're a parent, whether you're a superintendent, whether you're a teacher or a student, is just really looking at it through that lens. Mm. This idea of having like a set of questions that you ask every time you make these decisions seems so crucial to me. And I'm thinking, John, of your example of the single board member who kept trying to get this mm-hmm. issue on the table, right? Um, but it should be built in on the front end proactively, just part of our ways of working um, and decision-making. And Becky, your comments about what each of us can do Um, uh, are speaking to some of our listeners, I'm sure, uh, because of concerns about climate anxiety, right? Sometimes we feel like we're, you know, just victims. We can't do anything. Um, It's scary to think about the potential future, Um, but taking action can be a way of of healing and uh, and cultivating hope, right, for the future. Um, John, do you have a quick thought on the scale question? Yeah, so, you know, I, I started out as a high school social studies and civics teacher. So the, the civics teacher in me feels like we've got to hold elected officials more accountable. Right? If you're running for school board, you should know somebody's going to show up at every meeting and say, what are you doing on climate? What are you doing on environmental justice? If you're running for mayor, if you're running for county council, if you're running for state legislature, governor, Congress, president, they, they should know that everywhere they go, someone is going to raise their hand and ask about climate and environmental justice and expect answers and then come back and say, well, when you ran, you said we were going to increase solar. Well, I see solar has only increased by 2% over the last four years. So before I give you my vote again, what are you going to do to make sure that we're making much more rapid progress on the move to renewable energy. And I I think we have to start to hold folks accountable. And this is another way to combat, I think, some of that climate anxiety is to help young people, especially, see the tools that they can use to get the attention of policymakers and to hold policymakers accountable for getting done what we need to. Okay, I'm gonna do a a speed round of three final questions, one for each of you from the audience. 
Um, and the first one is about teachers. Um, and Becky, given your role, I'm gonna ask you to answer this question. Audience, the audience is asking about how to support teachers in this work. We know that our teachers and administrators are currently very overwhelmed with the pandemic and a host of other challenges. What is the best way to prepare and support them in taking action on this issue? Give us your, your thoughts. Brown. Um, so first of all, we have to prepare them. We have to make sure that they have uh, preparation from the beginning of uh, their, their time in teacher preparation courses ongoing throughout professional development. We have to support our teachers as leaders so that they can lead in this work. And we have to make sure that they have the resources. We can't ask them to do this on top of. This, ha this has to be integrated in the work. So it really does require that we think differently about, about teaching and learning, honestly. And I gave one example earlier, but how it is integrated in a way that it's not on top of a separate thing, but it's about everything we do so that when our students uh, graduate from high school, they are climate champions. They're already climate champions. They're already taking action. They already have the basic tools and, and, and ed education they need. So they are taking action now and into the future. So we need to support not just our teachers, and I wanna be clear about this, our other educators, our school bus drivers are leading the way on our clean buses. So let me be clear about that. Our nurses and counselors, our food our cafeteria, we're all of our educators, so that they have that training uh, and support that they need. And then we, we make sure that they have the time to do it. I so appreciate that, Becky. That is uh, music to my ears for sure. Um, Pedro, I'm going to ask you a question. This came from a high school student who's in the audience right now. He says, he, she or they says, I am a current high school student in Washington, D.C., and I'm helping to grow a network for students geared toward resolving environmental issues in our communities and across the nation. What is the best way to find and connect passionate high school students across the country to amplify our work? How do we as student leaders ensure that all narratives are included? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so you know, so you know, we're we're right now actually, you know, make you know, I want to create more structures for student voice. Uh, we have some good ones here in Chicago, but I want to do even more. I would love to create, you know, a national structure, and maybe you know, my colleagues here, you know, a national for students to be able to connect on this, uh, because I know I have passionate students here in Chicago that you know this would be you know about one of their top priorities, if not the top priority. I know this happens across the entire state, so I actually would love even to leverage the knowledge of our students. Cause you know, one thing, one of the things that I know our students know how to do, they know how to connect with each other, right? That's one of the things that we're still learning as adults. So trying to navigate the social media tools, but I would love, you know, and I would definitely champion that here in Chicago to create a structure here where my students can get access to other students across the country, specifically on issues that they all share, climate change being one of them that I think is very important. Pedro, that's terrific. Uh, people in the audience, I know from uh, uh, looking at what's coming up, people are looking for ways to form a movement and make connections with one another in this work. And someone asked, is there a forum, website, space, where schools around the world can share and learn about examples and stories? Does such a thing exist? Not yet, but we, we got the seeds. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, at K-12 Climate Action, our hope is now in this next stage of work for the report to be a tool to, for folks to mobilize in communities. And so the, the Aspen Institute is looking for ways to grow this effort. They're going to focus one of their next convenings on climate. That's an opportunity to bring folks together. Laura Shifter, who's been phenomenal leading the work of the K-12 Climate Action uh, Aspen Commission wants to help build that movement. We've got some great partners and uh, whether it's Sunrise or Sierra Club or League of Conservation Voters, there are, there are lots of folks who are organizing in this space, um, but we need to continue to grow the movement. And one of, one of our pitches in the report is, you know, is that philanthropy needs to step up and invest in the movement building here if we want to do right by our planet. Wouldn't that be amazing? We need this forum. 
Um, I know I would love to see that happen. And many people in this audience certainly would. We have one minute left. I'd love to do one last round of final words from each of you, words of advice um, or words of wisdom, um, especially as we face uh, perhaps the challenge of our lifetimes, certainly one of them. Um, Becky, let's start with you and we'll, we'll move around. Words of wisdom or advice. Oh my goodness, as I listen to this conversation, so first of all, thank you. This has been a highlight of my day. Um, uh, I, 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 it's rolling in my head is the poetry of the constitution. We, the people, we, the people, we, the people, all of us deserve that right to pursue happiness. And we can't do that if we can't breathe clean air, if we can't drink clean water, if a natural disaster wipes us out every time. We can't do that. So this is at the core of the work we have to do to be that more perfect union so that all of us, all of us can be um, uh, the, the, those leaders of a just society, all of us, most especially our kids, most especially our babies, can live into their brilliance. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. I know I needed to hear that. Pedro, any final words of wisdom from you or, or words of advice? You know, just what we said, you know, what my colleagues have been saying, this is an issue of equity. And I think we got to call it out. Um, you know, I, I grew up, you know, as an immigrant kid here in this country, never really speaking out about things that I was seeing because I was, you know, sort of, I was afraid to. And I just been inspired by the fact that our students right now, they, they speak up. They really do speak up. And, and that really motivates me because we just weren't brought up that way. And so I think, you know, always remember that this is an issue of equity and we have to call it out. And we have to call it out when we see it in our communities, when we see that communities are being desperately, you know, desperately in, uh, impacted by this. Um, and it's across all of our cities. And so I think that that would be the number one thing is let's ground ourselves in that. And then that will create hopefully an urgency to do something about it. Thank you, Pedro. And last, John, wanna bring it home? Sure, well, thanks, Jen. And, and thank you to Harvard Ed School for this forum. Grateful to Pedro and Becky for their role in the commission, but more than that, for just both of them, their incredible leadership in our sector. And I guess the, the note I'd, I'd end on is just to thank people. I, this last two years has just been brutally difficult for educators, for education support professionals, for parents. It's been really hard. And folks have persevered through to try to do whatever we can to support young people. And on this issue, uh, we got to keep pushing forward. And we're, we, unfortunately, you know, Becky made this point of we, we need the resources. We need the resources at the federal and state level. And we need folks to step up to support educators uh, in this moment, both as we try to tackle the consequences of all the disruptions of the last two years, and as we try to tackle this existential threat in the form of climate change. Uh, we don't have the luxury of choosing which to do. We, we've got to do both and we need the resources and support to, to do them. John, thank you. Becky, thank you. Pedro, thank you. I appreciate you so much. I know everyone who's been listening uh, does. Thank you for sharing your time, your energy, your wisdom. Let's keep this work moving. I know I'm motivated to make change. Thank you to our listeners. Um, really, thank you so much for joining us. You can visit this recording at, uh, oh, I just, there we go, gsc.harvard.edu backslash askwith um, to check it out, share it with your uh, friends and colleagues. Let's get the word out. Um, and together we can make the change uh, that our students and their families deserve. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.